Hello and welcome to another episode of Jackson Talks. Everybody, with me, your host, Jackson Stone, and I have a very, very special guest today. Actually, someone that I connected with over LinkedIn. We have a lot of mutual interests and purpose, and we're gonna discuss all that stuff today. But I'm joined in this hotel room in Dallas, Texas, uh, by Patrick Vensky. Hey, Jackson, thanks for having me, brother. Yeah, welcome to the show. It's very cool how small the world is. So I'm like, I'm big into mental health, right? So I find you on LinkedIn, and then I'm living in Las Vegas, and one of my friends is a big wrestler, and you guys are friends. It's kind of funny how yeah. you, you follow each other on Instagram. What a small world, the whole mental health, you know, athlete, uh, athletic community is. It's just amazing. Right. I agree. That's yeah, crazy. And then, yeah, we had like a couple phone calls, and then I was like, you should be on my podcast. Let me know when you're in Dallas. Absolutely. <laughs> and he texted me and said, and then, hey, I'll be I'm going to be in Dallas, bro. <laughs> it was awesome. Uh, maybe like two weeks ago, we connected. And then a company flew me out here. They're called Nisnik Behavioral Health. Mm. They're a smaller rehab company. And they work with, uh, you know, addiction, suicide prevention, all the stuff that's close to you and me. And I'm like, I'm going to be in Dallas in like nine days. And you're like, bring it on. And uh, here we are in this beautiful Dallas hotel room just talking, man. Yeah, it's yeah, awesome. Yeah. Very it's, cool. Yeah, it's really nice. We're in, we're in uptown, uptown Dallas for those that live in the area. Yeah. Um, those that don't, that's probably irrelevant <laughs> information. <for you. laughs> but um, we'll backtrack slightly. I got one question for you. Yes, sir. One question that I ask everyone who comes on my show. Um, I think it's um, an extremely important question. I think it's an important question to create more understanding, mm -hmm. open, honest communication, especially between mm -hmm. males or men, mm -hmm. um, considering that November is uh, Men's Mental Health Month, mm -hmm. um, and that's really important. So the question is, my regular listeners know, but those maybe that are watching this episode from your community don't know, but we should start treating this question with a little more sincerity um, and a little more honesty, but hopefully you've answered honestly, but I'm asking you, uh, Patrick, how are you doing, like for real? I'm doing really, really good today. Almost the year sober, but there was real darkness like five or six years ago where I was flagged as highly suicidal. Mm. But today I can truly say I'm content, I'm at peace. I'm not where I want to be right now in life, but where I need to be in life. Mm. So I feel content today. Can you, can you explain what that, that means a little bit? Where you, where I haven't, you need to be, where you want to be? It's almost like, you know, um, my background story is I made millions in real estate, lost it all, become an alcoholic. No, I'm living in recovery and sobriety. But what it means that I want all the stuff that I lost back overnight, mm. but right now I just need to be sitting here in this present moment with you and spreading the message about like mental health and you know awareness of like, it's okay not to be okay. But today, most men always say, yeah, I'm fine, bro. I'm fine, bro. Because they don't want to open up and say, you know what? I actually need some help. Mm. Uh, nowadays, I'm the person giving help and it feels really good. Yeah. Because playing in the NFL, I was too proud to admit that I needed help. My ego was in the way. When you ask me an honest question, I'm like, who are you to talk to me? I'm God, you know? So I was driven by ego, obsessed, and the alcohol didn't help. Mm. Yeah, um, we're gonna pull on a few of those things in a second. Yes, sir. But I wanna, I wanna double click on um, how do you now, being a, a man who's in recovery, get mm -hmm. guys to open up to you um, when maybe they're in the same stage that you were at previous? I think by being brutally honest and authentic, there's no ego to defend. There's no NFL logo to defend. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I know what it feels to be highly suicidal. I know the darkness that you feel in your soul right now, but please listen to me. There's some kind of light at the end of the tunnel. I always, it's a cliche thing, but I always say it's always darkest before dawn. But if we just, you and me make it through the night, we're going to be okay tomorrow because mm -hmm. I turned out to be okay. But five or six years ago, if you were coming to me, I was in a state of mind that I couldn't even tell you. I wouldn't even listen to you. Mm. So it's always a tough thing. Like, we have the right message, but how do you break through to you to get the message conveyed, you know? Yeah. yeah. Do you think a person has to have, like, enough pain and darkness or have, re have reached the typical rock bottom stage for someone then to... Reach to, out to ask for help, or like, because I want to reach people before that stage. Of course, I know you do as well. Mm -hmm. So like, there's that, there's that window there that we're like, I feel like we're missing people from like, okay, maybe they need help here. Are we missing the signs? Mm -hmm. Are we missing some of these things? And then now it's rock bottom. Now they absolutely need help. Like, 
you know, I'm trying to close that gap. You know, you know what I mean? And I'm with you 100%. I call it my gray market. They are not in rehab. It's not black, but they're not, not drinking. It's not white. They say, oh, my life is awesome because I have this house. But you need Prozac, Xanax, and you drink a bottle of wine every day. Is your life really manageable, mm. right? So back to the rock bottom. I call it the gift of desper desperation. But it's so tough nowadays because what's the rock bottom for somebody who's suicidal? If you attempt a suicide attempt, that's the really rock bottom. And we don't want you to succeed or follow through. We don't use the succeed word anymore, right? But it's just, what is your rock bottom? We try to get you help when you feel down, just to reach out to somebody. Yeah. Because it's a very dangerous rock bottom. Just like I work with people in recovery. You say, well, I'm going to shoot up one more time. But you've been sober for a year. You may overdose. I personally lost 10 people in the last year. That I know they're sitting like you and me right now. We went to all the AA and NA meetings, right? We're in recovery. I see them Sunday night. We're playing ping pong. They're healed, they're clean. Two days later, their parents find them dead, overdosed in the bathroom. Mm. So the rock bottom theory is a very dangerous one in the business that you and I are in, right? right? Because what is rock bottom? Exactly. We would like to catch them just before we become and try to do something dangerous to ourselves or to others, you know? Mm. Like, I would say, call people right now, find a hotline, find a school counselor, talk to somebody, especially with males. It's always like, yeah, I'm good, I'm good. And you're not good. And you can see it in their eyes, like, how can I break through to you? It's okay to be vulnerable or not as strong, you know? And that's something we have to work on, that stigma. That a male always has to be the stoic guy who makes the money and, you know, teaches his uh, kids, like, to play football and just has a beer and watches football on Sunday. But what about his internal state? Right. Is he in pain? Yes or no, you know? Can he even communicate his pain? Yeah. That's also, uh, I'm reading a lot of books about being a man again. It's kind of funny in our society if you think about it. It's kind of like a cartoonish character sometimes depicted in the movies, right? Either the very tough dad, you know, like the military type, yeah. or the cartoonish kind of goofy family guy who stumbles, you know? Both are not true depictions of males, if you think about it, right? Right. Once he brings his money home, usually the female goes to Costco, the mom runs the whole show, and he's just sitting there in his corner in his little man cave, mm. which is just an escape room, drinking beer, watching football. But is it really alive or is it just existing, you know? How do I teach that guy in the man cave who tries to numb himself every day with like football and Prozac and how do I tell this guy, bro, you need to wake up and we need to do something, you know, to live a life worthy of living, right. not functioning. And vice versa with a lot of like moms. They're so, you know, being the soccer mom and being on the school board and being pretty and having five kids and driving the minivan and doing the yoga class. Is it really a life that you want to live or is it just a role that society puts on you, you know? So it's kind of interesting stuff for us to consider. Very interesting. How do you wake us up, you know, from that existence, you know? Yeah. And I feel recovery is so selfish for me because my wife is taking care of my children right now. I have three beautiful kids. And I took like a year off for myself, like a sabbatical, right? But I needed it because without that year, I may be dead right now. Right. But how do I tell the guy who has the mortgage payments, the car payments, who lives the American dream in that uh, white fenced, uh, you know, white picket fenced house. And, but he, ha he has to make 10,000 a month just to break even. How do you tell the guy, hey... Jackson and Patrick want to go to like a holistic retreat with you and let's talk about your feelings. Yeah. The guy's like, man, I don't have time for you guys. I have to make, pay I have the bills. I literally have to take care of four other people. So how do, I, how do I come to this conclusion? So my gift of desperation was last year, uh, I told you I didn't have a problem with drinking. I almost weighed 400 pounds. And when I got into rehab, my blood pressure was 188 over 122. I was, I was a walking heart attack. So I'm down 70, I need to lose another 50. But I had this one year of recovery to really work on Patrick. Most people don't even have a week. Right, most people don't even get 24 hours to work on themselves. They fly to Las Vegas, pay for everything, go to Disney World, the kids have fun. And the only retreat at night is to have one more drink and then pass out on the bed. I mean, in today's climate, people are having a hard time finding one hour a day for themselves to go for a walk, to just breathe, to yeah. just like sit and just maybe even stare at a wall is good for you, right? But we're always constantly moving and having to do things and, and putting more pressure on ourselves to be, 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 be. It's um, constantly. And the social yeah. media, I'm sorry to interrupt, the social media image always. Because even if you have like a private jet, there's always one guy, some Russian guy with a bigger private jet, right? Mm -hmm. So in the old days, if you're in a village and you're like the richest guy in the village, I'm happy. I have 10 cows, 
you know, I'm good. I have enough milk. I have a goat. Everything is cool, right? Right. In nowadays world, even if you're like literally one of the richest people on planet Earth, there's always that relentless societal pressure to have more, more. And somewhere along the line, you lose yourself. Yes. Um, the NFL counselor who flew out to save my life in 2015, 2016, when I was so suicidal, he actually helps billionaires stay sober. And I always thought like, man, Jackson, if you're a billionaire, what's the problem? Because I have all the money. Right. You no, know, as we know, my old uh, boss, Jim Ersey from the Minneapolis Colts, they got him with the hydrocodones and he needed to go to rehab too. So money is not the final answer. That's the reason when I say contentment, I have an a internal peace right now that I'm okay right now in this moment. I'm okay sitting here being present with you, you know. Because even when we talk, I just wait for you to shut up so I can give you my... Uh, opinion, right? And then right. you wait for me and we have to feel... And sometimes it's just good just to breathe. I'm like, man, it's really nice just to be here in this moment, you know? Yeah, that's actually very interesting that you say that because <clears throat> I, tr I try to watch these episodes back at least to try to get some... We're, mm -hmm. we're both former athletes, right? Mm -hmm. So we're watching tape back. We're studying. Yeah, we're yeah. trying to get better at it. Yeah. It's part of just who we are as people. And so when I do watch it, uh, I think when people watch on YouTube, they can see it because they actually can see the pause that I'm taking, mm -hmm. like when I'm trying to digest what someone said before I respond. Mm -hmm. But if they listen to it like via audio, Spotify, Apple, like it's just like a silent moment. I understand. But I see you actually taking it in and processing it and asking me an intelligent question as opposed to like a rapid fire questionnaire. Right. Okay, thanks, Pat. Hey, good, good luck with the recovery. See you soon, you know. <laughs> and then usually I have to have like a little plug in. Uh, make sure you call my company and go on my Facebook page, you know. Right. It's just amazing how that works. But it's really nice to see somebody who actually is present in the moment. I teach, uh, speaking of plug, I'm teaching, a, <laughs> I'm teaching, a, a, you know, the, the 10 pillars of mental mastery. Yeah. So my company is called Mental Mastery Motivation. The first pillow the first key is mastering the moment mm. because if i'm not with you in terms of mindfulness i can't even engage with you as a human being right because i'm so busy you know pushing and promoting and i'm not even here so sometimes it's okay just to be quiet for a second and just think you know yeah i'd love to go through all those 10 pillars because my my community is very uh like mental health is very important to them. I mean, I talk about it on every episode mm -hmm. and they, they seem to come back every episode. So I think it's very important to them. So I'd like to go through those 10 pillars. But uh, speaking of number one, like... Mastering the moment. All the good stuff happens in the present moment and My the bad stuff, which is you can't have a good life without bad days. And, and so... <laughs> That brings me to pillar number two. It's event plus response equals the outcome. That's really a stoic approach, right? My response dictates my outcome, not the event. Because what is good and bad by what we make of it? You know, uh, Phoenix Recovery was like a big group and, you know, they wanted me to be the Las Vegas manager and all the interview went really well. And in the end, I didn't get hired by Phoenix Recovery. Mm. And I'm like, God, it's my life's calling, you know, like it's recovery for the people, you know. And now here I am like two months later in a way cooler situation with another company who wants to support me and I'm so blessed. But in the moment, I'm like, oh my God, you know, it does seem like it was literally thing. a job. Like if you look at, you know, like has to be in recovery, has to have like a bachelor degrees, has to speak a second language, which I'm from Germany. So I'm like, and has to be like strong networking skills. And I used to run the whole show as a uh, NFL alumni president for the Jacksonville Jaguar chapter. Yeah. So it's natural to me to network and go to happy hours and find companies to donate money to good cause. Right. I'm like, I was born for this role. <laughs> and then like, I didn't call back after the third interview. I'm like, Huh, but you know what? I'm still alive. I always do like a check, you know, am I safe right now in this moment? Do I have water, food, shelter? Are my basic needs taken care of? Because in America, our level of living is so high, our standard of living, it's always, we're so unsatisfied all the time. Mm -hmm. If I have the Lexus, I want the Porsche. Most people in India who don't have a car don't have those problems. So all of our suffering comes from always wanting to be more which puts us into the, in the future. We are never truly in the moment. Of course, in the moment, you have to be happy. There's only the moment. And then, of course, I go back old school AA sayings, you know, like one leg in the past and one leg in the future, you peeing on the present. That's the old school, the old timers, you know, wow, in the room. that's an amazing saying. They, they, they smoke cigarettes and they have that coffee. Hey, at what time does a 7 a.m. meeting start? They're up since 4 a.m., you yeah. know, drinking coffee. They all, you know, but that's all, you know, like pretty much the, the past is like regrets and guilt and shame. And the future is anxiety. So one leg here and one leg there, you're literally peeing on the present. You're not in the present moment. Mm. And in our hyper 
fast society, nobody is ever truly present. Right. That's the reason nobody is doing like a breathing exercise for five minutes. Right. Five Doesn't minutes. have to be like a yoga retreat or a monastery, just to catch your breath. You know, like today in this moment, I'm okay. I'm. I have food, shelter. I'm safe. Most people can say that. So I change the perspective a lot with my kids. But again, when I talk to a high school, if I don't catch the moment, they are comp I'm competing with TikTok. We just talked about social media. There's super beautiful ladies on TikTok. There's guys with eight packs. They always look perfect. There's funny kitty cats on YouTube. You know, there's so much mental distraction just for me to get my message through to kids nowadays. Yeah. It's very difficult. It it's very, very difficult. Yeah. I teach the event plus response equals your outcome to mm -hmm. my to my athletes mm -hmm. <clears throat> regarding baseball like you make an error you strike out mm -hmm. okay that's the event how do you respond yep. because generally in sports another play is coming right to you mm -hmm. you always get an opportunity to make another play and it parallels life right whatever the event happens sometimes it's uncontrollable sometimes bad things just happen and there's no explanation for them um but what's your response to that it doesn't mm -hmm. have to be an immediate response but how over the long haul can you give yourself patience and grace and time and forgiveness to then have a different set of outcomes that you would, that are unexpected based on how the event went is, is basically how I look at it. It is the most powerful formula I use. I mean, every day in my everyday life. Mm -hmm. It's really based on stoicism yeah. before Jesus Christ even, you know. It's very interesting. So I'm heavy into stoicism. It's not like a Tony Robbins thing. It's just like only response controls uh, your outcome of the event. So that's one of the most powerful formulas I use too. It's extremely powerful. Because we have to change our response. I'm like, hey, we're all in rehab, guys. So, so far, our events was usually past trauma or tragedy. Something happened to us, mm -hmm. right? In my case, I lost millions of dollars in the real estate crash, going from like driving a Benz and a Rolls Royce to food stamps. So that was my event, very tragic, right? Poor yeah. Patrick. But my response wasn't good. I just took more painkillers and drank more alcohol because I had, still had my NFL response instilled. But it didn't work for the new situation anymore. And my outcome was that I was like 45 years old and I'm in rehab. And my wife is like fighting for a divorce. I have not seen my kids. I have to change my response, bro. So that's what I tell people. We really have to change. I can't go back and uh, make those tragic events disappear. But I can work on a better response to have a better daily outcome, you know. Right. Yeah, so that's interesting that you mentioned that. And that goes heavy back into Nick Saban's Alabama, the process. The biggest thing as an offensive lineman, if I just jump off side and it affects my next play, because now I'm rattled, right? right? Or you just beat me for a sec, now you're overset and you get me on the inside, right? So in athletics, I have to be super present in the moment. Exactly. Only this one play matters. Nothing else matters. It's very hard to do. Very hard to very do. Very hard to stay present in yeah. athletics. Yeah. And then, I mean, you take that into life, right? You're trying to be present, at least try for one moment at a time. Then you stitch that moment together. Now it's couple minutes at a time now it's a couple hours at a time mm -hmm. now you're in kind of flow of the of the deal and then you can think about your past and your future while still in the present moment because you have an understanding of more what's going on instead of being in the past or catastrophizing about the future that's you're actually that's in the present and you can learn from some of those things or prepare manage your expectations for the future and learn from what happened in the past by actually being in the present more often that's the reason a lot of like um what I call a kinetic feedback change or like a grounding exercise or even I just took an ice cold shower, right? Mm -hmm. If you change your physical state, your state of mind changes a little bit too. It brings you back to the present moment. Right. Otherwise, we're always future tripping or regretting the past. Oh, I should have bought Amazon stock in 1999. <laughs> okay, Pat, that's like 20 years. Get over yourself, right? Come on, bro. You know, but it's always like that's how we always, you know, the pendulum swings, but it should be right here in this moment. And that's especially mental health. A lot of people tell me, I have this racing thoughts and they never calm down. And I came to the uh, conclusion that meditation, just or mindfulness, I'm trying to slow down that racing train. Mm -hmm. Trying to not control it, but try to minimize that train that's always racing, you know. So that's something I work with my people too, you know. I try to be present. But it's difficult. Because even at the end of the game, I'm like, I'm thinking about my grade already. I'm like, I'm grading already 95%. Just to give you an example about football, um, let's say you have 60 snaps in professional football and you make three mistakes, that's a 95% grade. That gets you fired, by the way. <laughs> Most people think it's like an A plus in academics, you know. If I give up a quarterback sack, an offside, a holding, that's potentially benching a course or maybe a cut. If a quarterback you throw three pick sixes, unless you get a $100 million guaranteed contract, you're going to go bye-byes real fast. 
So I cannot be in the last three or four snaps, like change my play because I want to have a good grade. I'm thinking, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm cruising now, right? I got this. That's when you get your butt kicked in the last mm -hmm. seconds because you lost the present moment. It's very interesting. You're not present anymore because I'm thinking future tripping. I wonder how my grade, oh, my girlfriend's going to be home tonight. I'm going to have a nice dinner. I can't wait to get drunk on the plane, yeah. right? And I lost the moment and I get my ass kicked. That will happen in football, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, moving on, number three. It depends what kind of school I talk to, right? It's usually mastering the process, mm, but also like it's, uh, that's like Alabama, you know, stoicism, you know, play by play. We just talked about it. Right. I go into like mastering the ego too, because you have to, the ego cannot control you, but it's very difficult for athletes because the ego has been good to me. Right. It made me rich and famous. And who are you to tell me that I'm in trouble? Right. So uh, mental health and or addiction, the ego is the biggest obstacle sometimes. Because look at me, I have 50 million bucks in the bank. I don't have a drinking problem. While I'm drinking with Jackson, right? I'm like, no, you can't tell me what to do. Look at me. So that's something we have to break through with like professional athletes or even like famous celebrities. They're screwed on drugs and pills, but like Eminem was talking about his recovery journey. He had, if you would tell him that he had a pill problem, he would fire you. Oh man. He's like, who are you, Jackson? Patrick, who, who are those clowns? Gone. Because his inner circle keeps feeding him with a bad behavior, with right. addictive behavior. So how do I break through an ego of like an M&M who has, what, 100 million fans, 100 million bucks in the, in the bank, mm -hmm. and he's popping like hydros every day? I'm like, how do I get through to this guy? So that's mastering the ego. It's, go, it's going back to like changing perspective. For example, 2 billion people on planet Earth live on like 2 or 3 bucks a day. We go downstairs and have like a $7 Frappuccino. Uh -huh. We have a higher standard of living than most people. We are in the top 1%. Right. But we are looking in America, especially always at the 0.001%, the billionaires, the, the, the jet lifestyle. You know, and on social media, you know, they get the most following. I can't believe even like uh, drug dealers, they get glamorized. They always have the Lamborghini and the hot girls. Right. And now you have Mr. Garrison saying, Drugs are bad. Okay, guys, drugs are bad from South Park, Mr. Garrison, you know. Drugs are bad. How do you compete with that? How do I make sobriety sexy? That's the thing. Like, that's the ego thing, too. I had the hardest time because my way worked. Never surrender. Never missing a day of practice and just taking more pain medication to make it through one more day. Just to function. But it didn't work in my addiction because I took more and more to numb my feelings and keep sending money home. I was just functioning to send money home to my family. In, in, they were living in Idaho. I was working in Jacksonville, Florida. And I'm living in a beautiful penthouse and I'm in my dark room trying to drink myself to death. It, it was, that was just amazing. But the ego told me it worked for me to make history as the first German player in the NFL. The ego had to be kind of smashed and squashed a little bit to be open. So all those things, I made a lot of breakthroughs in the last year, you know. Yeah. I've been in AA rooms for like the last six or seven years. But to really comprehend all the teachings, ego has to be mastered, you know. You have to be willing to receive all of it. Yeah. Right? You have to be in a state of mind to want to receive. Someone can tell you all these good things, all these helpful things, all these tools that will make you potentially feel better. Mm -hmm. But if you're not willing to receive them, none of them are going to hit. It's, I can give you the best diet book in the world if you're not ready to shed some weight. Or, you know, I can give you all the weightlifting tools. If you don't want to hit the gym, it's not going to change your life, it's you know. Change. It's the same with AA. And then we, come, we will circle back to the gift of desperation. How do we help people saying, you are here, don't go here. Because I wasn't afraid of death. And I said, well, I'm a German soldier. I, I don't care if I die. And then my sponsor said a very powerful thing. I think that's applicable to uh, the suicide prevention tool a little bit. What if you don't die, but you wake up in a wheelchair? You wake up on a breathing machine for the next 60 years. You didn't finish the job, in quotation marks, yeah. quote, you know. You didn't finish the job, and now you're stuck in a wheelchair. You can't wipe your own butt. No, that scared uh, the living hell out of me. Mm. And that's to all people who may struggle with, like, suicidality. Um, you're in a bad state of mind right now. You don't want to leave this earth. You just want to change a state of mind. So then people like you and me, like how can we be of service to help you change that state of mind? Right. Because that's just a final solution to a temporary problem. And it's not the 
right solution. It's not a solution at all. They're changing a lot of things nowadays. As you know, in the uh, suicide prevention community, it's not a successful suicide attempt, you know, because it's, it's terrible, you know. Right. So they're changing um, those terms right now. So I got mental health uh, first aid certified with the NFL. So I'm not a therapist, a counselor, but when you're having a rough day, at least I check up on you. Right. Hey, you okay, man? I'm just, you know, want to see how we're doing, you know? And then when I see some of those symptoms that you display, I'm trying to maybe get you connected to help. It's like doing CPR in a swimming pool while the lifeguard is running towards you, just to save a life in that moment, right. you know? I deal with a lot of soldiers, man, uh, SEALs. They're very similar to athletes. Let's say you're the best sniper in the world, Jackson. And then you go back, but you can't work at Walmart or like Bank of America as a teller. I mean, you're literally the best in the world, and the skill doesn't transfer to our society. So you have post-traumatic stress, an addiction problem, your wife divorced you because you did five combat tours. You can't work because society tells you, you're not good enough to make $40,000 a year. You're not good enough. That's what I deal with sometimes. Mm -hmm. Just like an NFL player, when I went to the unemployment line, what do you do? I'm like, I push people around really well, and I build huge houses and flip them. Like, well, can you work here? I'm like, no, my knees. Can you work there? No, I'm stressed out. So I was not employable in the real world. It's very interesting stuff. So I feel that pain. Right. And all they want is to have that pain ending. But the point is, how can we make your life worth living as opposed to looking at all the other dark angles we can go, you know? I know it's very personal to your own story. That's the reason you start the whole Your Love Foundation, you know? Right. And that's always the main question. How do I get to you before you do anything foolish? How do I get to the 18-year-old guy who had a couple of drinks, pops a Xanax, and then he's driving, he kills a family, and he will never see, he will never have a life outside of prison. But you got away with driving drunk so many times, how do I get through to you? Your ego, I'm like, man, I'm a great drunk driver, man. I got this, bro. How do I get through to you? I know it's sometimes like scaring people doesn't help because in the NFL, we're watching those terrible like DUI, you know, like this gruesome accidents and dead people. <laughs> the lights came on and the first guy said, man, that was tough. I need a cold one. And we thought it was the funniest thing we ever heard <laughs> because we're so jaded and battle hardened. You're not going to scare me, right? Right. So all those dare videos and all those things, I don't know if I can scare you into changing behavior. I need to connect to you on a human level and tell you that maybe we can change something together. Right. I think that's where the, um, the power of the personal story comes in. Absolutely. Because if I can get to know, I'm not going to just <clears throat> sit down for coffee the first time meeting with you and just start spilling my short, whole story. Because mm -hmm. you'll feel something by that story. But in, unless we're deeply connected, that story won't impact you on a later date. Mm -hmm. So we have to then get to know each other, right? You're very vulnerable sharing your story or what brought you to this point, your NFL career, how it relays or parallels to the person that you're talking to. And then... You try to get through to them on that level. And then maybe during that conversation, their life isn't changed. But down the road, a few days, they start thinking about it more and more. And they start altering a little bit day by love, day because of what you said here. I love that. Planting a seed exactly. of consciousness to maybe reach out for help. That's just my main message. It's okay not to be okay for today. But if those days keep piling on, maybe reach out to somebody. Right. Most, especially males, don't even know who to reach out to. Because, you know, especially teenage boys, you know, I mean, how do we prevent those dark thoughts? How can you open up when opening up is perceived as weakness? That's tough because in my active NFL career, I would never share anything. I had 17 concussions. I would never report one. 17? 17. Uh, I broke every single finger. I didn't miss a day of practice. Not a single day of practice missed. Because you had broken fingers or concussions? Yeah, broken toes, everything, everything. I just had to go take another, <laughs> shoot it up, and let's go. So how do I tell the young Patrick, who was like full of ego and pride and pain, to reach out, you know? So maybe it had to come in my personal story to the alcoholism to now be able to help people. But also, I cut it very close. How do we catch him before we're cutting it too close? Yeah. Because if I died of a heart attack at 400 pounds last year, I wouldn't be sitting here right now sharing my positive story of recovery, right? So how do we catch people and offer the resources necessary before it's too late? I hooked up with a really cool company. It's called the STAR, S-T-A-R app. Yeah. And it's developed by Ohio State. And one of my buddies uh, bought the app. Uh, he owns like 80% of the company and we're rolling it out. They're taking a baseline 
of your mental health. So you go in there, hey, how are we feeling today, Jackson? Like a real answer, you know? And they don't connect your name to the data. So we only have a baseline of 70, right? But now you have a really rough week and you go down to a 20. So now you appear suicidal. We now send you the resources, the notifications triggered by your score, custom to you without me knowing that you're in trouble. Without it saying my name and all this yeah. stuff. Yeah. So that really helps with teens and schools and firefighters who are maybe too proud to admit that they have a problem. Right. Because that's the thing too, like first responders, my job is to save people's life. I don't have a problem. But you've seen more trauma than most people outside a war zone. How do I help the firefighter, the EMT, the cop, who maybe shot somebody like in his, in his, in his job, you know? Right. So I'm more excited, maybe we come back in like three or four months, back on your show, mm -hmm. and tell people, make this resource available, you know? Yeah. I want to bring it to every single school in the United States, every single um, university, because I really feel like, in my case, it would be Patrick went from a 70, which is a good score, to like a 10. They would send the NFL suicide prevention hotline mm -hmm. to my private notification. Directly to your phone. And they have an SOS button where it connects me with a, a counselor or a, a hotline. I was really blown away by it, and I hope we can bring it to every single person, you know, who needs it. Because if you ask me, Pat, honestly, how much do you drink? I say, maybe one or two glasses of wine. But if I have an anonymous like, survey without my name, it's two or three bottles yeah. of wine every day. Right. There's no judgment. <clears throat> you know, the school counselor, hey, Jackson, how, how are we doing today? But this is like, more like a survey that nobody knows it's me. I can be brutally honest in my assessment. We're more inclined, at least, to be yeah. honest. Yeah. And, that's, yeah. and that's the first step in, in kind of getting... Yeah. The help that you need. You have yeah. to be honest with yourself. Like in-person survey bias, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you ever watch porn? No. Never. Do you ever drink? Do you ever drink any alcohol? No. Never. I'm an angel. I mostly spend my time volunteering at church. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So it's kind of interesting. So I hope that app can help. You know, we have to scale it up to really bring it to the people. You know. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's. I mean, when you were telling me about that a couple of weeks ago, it sounded amazing. Yeah, I was pretty stoked about it. That's when we first connected over the phone. I was, yeah. But it needs to be like implemented and some schools have those programs too and there's some maybe HIPAA violation. We need to make sure that everything is okay, you know. But that's what I'm working on right now. Amazing. Yeah. Um, I want to go kind of go back to something that you said. Okay. Because <clears throat> you, you obviously played in the NFL. Mm -hmm. How long did you play in the NFL? I played four years in the league and like 10 years professionally like NFL Europe and yeah. CFL. Yeah. And so to make it to that, the highest level possible for a football player, mm -hmm. There has to be some level of these things that we were talking about, right? There mm -hmm. has to be, at least that's perceived. Mm -hmm. I believe that to be the best in the world at something, you can also have overall really good wellness. I think both of those th things can go hand in hand. But in today's culture, people don't view it that way. I think they view it as you have to have some sort of borderline ego, past confidence. You have to be um, on the grind all the time. You can never take any days off. Mm -hmm. You have to be this tough nails person who only kind of thinks about their sport and is kind of hyper self-critical so you can make it to the best in the world. And then once you get to be the best in the world, then you can start to uh, optimize your wellness because you're already there and, and you have all these different things in place. But I think now if we can teach young athletes that on the way to that, you can optimize your wellness by thinking about your recovery, you know, um, understanding your self-talk, having confidence, but that doesn't bleed into arrogance or, or ego into your own life. Um, what do you think about that? Oh, that's a loaded question, my it friend. It is, I know, I know. Because it goes back to the chicken or egg question, right? Is elite athlete, like if you're like competing on elite level, does <laughs> it cause mental health problem? Or do you have to be crazy to do this stuff? Because if you swim for 10 hours a day, it's going to drive you nuts, right? right? But you have to be nuts to enjoy swimming for 10 hours a day, right? Yeah. So I only can speak from my personal NFL experience. People ask me, hey, little Johnny wants to play football, you know? He's 10 years old. Uh, how can he make it to the league? I'm like, get him out to a barn, get a little lamb, give little Johnny a gun, and see if he can pull the trigger. If he can pull the trigger, if you hear that drive, that killer instinct, then you may have a chance. You just doubled your chances. But it's my personal opinion, because my theory in football is that the more pain and trauma you receive as a young child, the more you're willing to dish it out. Mm. And I'm not saying that every single football player has like, you know, sexual abuse as a child or like getting beat up by his dad. Right. But that drive has to come from somewhere. Mm. Could be extreme poverty that drives you to excel. It could be ego, pure ego. In my case, it was pure ego. I was literally German symbol of football. I was chosen by God to be the best in the world. So it was pure ego. And it helped me for a long time till it didn't work anymore, right? 
it's a very interesting question when you say can you make to the elite level and still have like a manly like normal like a normal life have your wellness a well-rounded life i just don't know because it's a complete dedication to one cause you don't go out for pizza you watch your macros you know you don't have i mean on the way home from the game you already watch the next game there's a there's an obsession mm -hmm. like a bill belichick he won the super bowl and he was really upset that he lost four weeks of preparation for the next season it's like hey bill you won the super bowl are you happy right now it's like no we lost four weeks for the next season because he made it to the playoffs <laughs> that's insanity right but that's that's how you have to be to be on that level so it's a really good question can a well-adjusted, normal, well-balanced person achieve elite athletic accomplishments? I don't know if I can answer that today. I, mean, I think about it all the time because I coach 13 to 18. Mm -hmm. And they're at the stage, right, where, where things are getting a little more serious, right? You can tell at age 13, like, does this guy have something, right? Mm -hmm. How are we going to cultivate this? But how mm -hmm. are we going to keep it fun and passionate? especially in the sport of baseball where you're failing all the time. Mm -hmm. So someone who's 13, it's very challenging to stay passionate about someone if you're not having a good day. Mm -hmm. And so how do we keep cultivating these things while also optimizing their wellness, their friendships, their school, uh, maintaining that sense of not being so hypercritical or putting too much pressure on yourself? Like what are their parents telling them when they yeah. go home? Yeah. Um, and how do we build that up to, to you become this elite player the way you want to play, but still, you know, uh, having a sense of... of of oneness with yourself, like being able to handle yourself in different environments, having relationships outside of sport. Um, so I think about that uh, often, but I don't know either. The, the, it, like, if it's like, cause you look at like Michael Phelps mm -hmm. and all these folks. DUIs, I mean, who, you know, who, who, who swims at, 12 hours a day in the pool, right, all he, day. He didn't take a day off for like three straight years. Yeah. You know, and you know, so what is life after sport? Right? How, does, how do we help cultivate life after sport? Um, how do we untether the strengths that you built in sport to put into a real life scenario like you talked about with the Navy SEALs? Like what are those strengths that we can apply to a real life job to, to be in society and be ideal and cooperative? Like there's so many different questions when it comes to like, because people don't understand the dark side of going after sport. They don't. All they see is TV, the contracts. Right. And you know, the funny thing is and whenever- parents don't see the dark side. Whenever somebody blows his knees out on football, they go straight to a Bud Light commercial. You never see the pain when your ACL is blown out. Mm -hmm. Hey, we go quick, quick commercial break, have a Bud Light. We see some Michelob Ultras, you know, beautiful girls in bikinis, having fun playing <laughs> beach volleyball. Yeah. You never see that, that that man worked for 20 years to get paid and he will never walk again. You never see those things, you know, the pain, the everyday, the degradation in practice, you know, um, it's a really tough question for me to answer. Maybe it goes back to like, true stoicism make it independent of the outcome if you win the gold medal great if not at least you give it all you had right right so focus on the effort that you can look in the mirror at night and i gave it all i had today and that's enough for me yeah but with such an outcome uh, oriented society it's so funny because even like winning a silver medal out of eight billion people it's unbelievable yeah one's like oh he didn't win gold because america is like a winner takes all society in you in europe it's okay we have the olympic principle and we have like we call it the vice champion or like the second winner mm -hmm. so you can be the, the the champion of the league like super Bowl winner yeah and then the second like the vice champion right okay. like the vice president and in the states it's winner takes all nobody cares if you finish second in the 100 meter really nobody remembers your name it's a brutal brutal competitive society it you is. have to be crazy to match that craziness and then here's 100 million bucks and enjoy your life and now you can't train anymore You've been training for 20 years. Now you retire at age 30 or 35. What are you supposed to do with your time? And then all your friends, let's play golf and get drunk at the golf course. Oh, okay. You don't know what to do anymore because you still have that obsessive mindset. Right. I have a very hard time not having a protocol. Even like 20 years, you know, like even like in college, going on a vacation, uh, flying home to Germany in the plane, every single weightlifting session was mapped out. Mm -hmm. Jet lag or no jet lag, I knew exactly. Wednesday morning was bench press, Thursday was heavy squats, you know. Every single minute was planned out, even on my vacation for 20 years. So now having kids, my wife's like, let's go with the flow, you know, hang out. A, flow is late, and who's flow? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't go with the flow because right. that guy's late, you know. It's a very militaristic mindset I still have after 10 years after my last game mm. and 20 years after my Jaguar years. Isn't it? It's crazy. 
I give my little girl a ride to school at 7.25. School's at 7.30. The teacher isn't there at 7.31. I have a mental breakdown, bro. I'm like, you want me to teach the school for you? You want me to open the door for you? You want me to shovel the snow? Because you're not doing a good job on your own school. I can do it better. It's pure ego telling the teacher, the principal of the school, to open the school at 7.30. Because we said 7.30. We did not say 7.31. Mm. Even when you called me today at 8.29, we were, met, we were meeting at 8.30. I'm like, that's a good man. 8.29. Right on time. Not sloppy. It's interesting, and it has no application well, I this, to... I have the same, it's right, right? same view with time. It, it's like, just I amazing. I cannot stand... People who are late, and I'm really trying to work on it. I know because like, in the grand scheme, it doesn't matter. People right? have things to do. Maybe they got caught up here. Maybe there was traffic. Maybe they just like decided to do this one extra thing before they left the house. It's not like a disrespectful thing to me. Sometimes it is. Sometimes people are just kind of mean and don't respect your time. But those aren't your like close people, right? Those aren't the people you care about or like school situations. Mm -hmm. But I have the same thing. I'm like, if I, I need to do, I'm doing this, this, this here. I'm trying to be more free and more spontaneous now because I'm. I'm not, not in sport anymore. I just live my life, but I run a couple businesses and, mm -hmm. you know, things have to go as planned, but sometimes you just kind of do it. And I, I have the same kind of, I'm like, okay, yeah, you know, it's like, what it, are we it, doing? It was a huge cultural clash when my wife uh, brought my children to Germany, my Germanic grandparents waiting like punctual, you know, military style, you know, uh -huh. and then what are you going to do? A little one like made a big poop in the diaper. We have to change the diapers, right? To me, it's inconceivable. It was a very clash, a cultural clash between being a, a parent and kind of seeing the kids run the show yeah. and me not running my show. It was, how are we late for a lunch in Germany? It's impossible. So it even like, so back to the mental health, I'm still heavily affected by being afraid of being late, uh, not making the team mm -hmm. and uh, abandonment, rejection. Right. That means I'm not on the squad anymore. That's life or death for me. Yeah. That's the reason. It's not about 7.30 or 7.31. The point is, I didn't make it on time. We had a three strike rule in college. If you're late for a team meeting, that's one strike. Three strikes, you're off your team. So I, I associate being punctual with life or death because I define my life through being on the team, being the best football player and the ego comes into play, right? All those things. And like, how do you, even 20 years later, I'm still, I can't be late. I can't be late. I can't be late. You know, it takes a long time. So it's easy to say like wellness and be well-rounded and, you know, meditate and I do all those things, but I still get stressed out when I'm like five minutes behind schedule because my internal clock is always ticking. Right. That's interesting, huh? It is. Because it has no, like, really, like I talk about like the global perspective and people in India are starving. I'm like, man, it's 8.30. We should really start this interview. It's unbelievable because it does, has no, you know, if we do it at nine or 9.30, it doesn't really matter, you know? So I'm working on that consciously saying, oh, Patrick, that's ego talking. That's uh, old programming that doesn't serve you anymore. Mm. Just be mindful in the moment right now because it's still a wonderful day. So I try to get myself, when I catch those patterns, I instantly try to bring myself back to the present moment. Right. Because Coach Coughlin will not yell at me because he doesn't know that I'm in Dallas right now if I'm two minutes late for our interview, right? So that took me a long time of uh, reprogramming my own um, behavioral patterns. Yeah. Yeah. You said something... Um, that I think is really important, that you do all this stuff, right? There's a priority for your mental health, right? There's mindfulness, there's meditation, there's trying to practice being in the present moment. For me, there's like journaling and exercising. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you do the same thing. And all of these things are part of our mental health toolkit. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean that every day is perfect. No. That's the point, right? You, but if we didn't do any of these things, every day would be much, much worse. It would start piling up. And we become more reactive. Exactly. We can't respond anymore. We just react, you know? And so doing these types of things doesn't prevent you from not having bad days or not getting stressed out or not having anxiety. It just allows you to handle it more appropriately uh, and more effectively and uh, more healthy, I believe. That's the idea of these, these protocols and these toolkits. And now, yeah. of course, there's there's more severe forms of mental health conditions that deserve a little bit more health care and treatment, of course. But if we're just talking about everyday wellness, everyday mental health that everyone has, implementing these protocols will help you just have emotion, a more emotional agility and be able to pivot a little bit more mm -hmm. in relation to like what we did in sport. And also the simplest way I found for people listening right now or watching us on YouTube, um, you need to, two bookends. You need to control the start of the day and the end of the day. Mm. That's your time. That's your 
if you master those bookends, it's one of the day mastering the day. It's one of the little things they say. Yeah. You know, the first 20 or 30 minutes, that's your time. Mm -hmm. And it feels selfish and you should listen to the girls and to the little kids screaming. We have to make breakfast. No, you have to get your butt out of bed half an hour early because it's your time. And you have to be very, very selfish about the meditation, the prayer, and then maybe a small workout or like an ice cold shower. Right. Because you feel like, you know what, I'm seizing the day. I'm in control. What do we, I mean, all of us, 99% of all people in the Western Hemisphere, what we do? We wake up, look at the cell phone, OMG. I cannot believe she said this on Facebook. Oh, look at the Instagram post. Oh my God, my boss, my boss's email at 2 a.m. in the middle of the night. I'm like, oh my God. And you're instantly in a panicky reactive mode. Yep. But for 30 minutes, you don't uh, look at your phone. You do the thing that you want. It makes you feel like in control of your day. I use certain techniques. Uh, of course, the gratitude list is a very old school thing. Uh, Tim Ferriss teaches like the monkey brain. If like five things stress you out, you put them on paper. Like, you know, I have to pay my bills today, I have to do this. You know, you put them on paper and you kind of give some space for those things that stress you out. Right. You write them out and then they're off your mind. Yeah. Otherwise, they overwhelm you every day, right? But uh, so I'm big on like anchoring my day with a strong morning. And then at night, I always reflect. I try to make amends, you know, if I was rude to you, if I was being mean to you. What could Patrick have done differently this day? And I say, hey, I was rude to the cleaning lady or... I was nice to Jackson. So make my amends tomorrow and then just, I want to go to bed with a clean slate so I can wake up refreshed. Mm. But how many of us do that? Because we, well, what do we do at night, Jackson? We will look at the news. Rape, murder, plunder, uh, left-wing nutjobs, right-wing nutjobs, right? It's just so crazy. We never have a time to like for ourselves to decompress. Right. Right? And just, yeah. Sleep protocol, sleep hygiene, but all those things sound really good in product, like in the theory. But then you talk to a mom who has three kids who scream all night, and one of the kids just got sick. It's called a kid and screams, and like, oh, Jackson and Pat, they are, they have great protocols, but here's a kid screaming. Right. That's something that my wife and I discuss all the time. There's my little perfect, like stoic, Joko Willick, Tim Ferriss, Joe Rogan kind of. Sure. Here's what we want to do. She's like, yeah, and then one kid just fell off the tree, and that's what we have to do right now, you know? Right. So that was really tough for me, you know? Yeah. To, it's, it's how do we actually apply it to people's everyday life? Yeah. How do you but, make it a priority? But then again, you go back to, well, I didn't get everything that I wanted, but at least I got my two anchors in. That gives me some kind of sense of accomplishment. Right. Even like, uh, like uh, what I call, um, low level tasks like mopping or like cleaning up it needs to have a sense of accomplishments because if you check email there, you will never be done with all the emails if you do like a to-do list it's always like 50 things to do right mm -hmm. so one thing I learned I like to like a small like mechanical or like a very low level task even like doing the dishes I do it right and I do it at my time at my pace I feel like I accomplished something for the day right so let's go back to like Buddhism and Zen in the moment right if you just clean the little pot and you're the best at cleaning the little pot, that's a small victory for you. But most of us, while we're cleaning the little um, dishes, there's TV blaring, the kids are screaming, we have to pay the bills, we're never truly fully in the moment. And then it comes to like mental mastery, right? If you're a master for one second, I go back to Eckhart Tolle, you know, the power of now. Yep. If you're in the moment, you're a master. For this one moment, you are mastering everything. You don't have to live 20 years in a monastery, right? But the second your brain jumps to like, hey, we can do this for the rest of our lives. Hey, what's, what's next? What's next? You already lost the moment. True mindfulness is very hard to accomplish, especially with our hyperactive uh, lives, you know, with the kids screaming and, hey, mom, I need help with homework. Hey, mom. My, my wife probably listens to like, hey, mom, like 500 times a day. Mm -hmm. And literally, I love my children, but they sit at the table. Everything is made for them. I'm like, hey, mom, can you get me a silverware? It's like, here's a spoon. You can get it from this little table right there. It's like, hey, mom, can we get an ice cold water? It's like, there's the water. You can get it from the fridge. You know, and they're like 16, 12, and 9, you know. Right. It's not like they're babies, you know. Like, hey, mom. And she's like, oh, here we go again. So she always has that very uh, grounded uh, view. You have Joko Willick and the 4.30 getting up and the 4.30 club, right? Yeah. Well, I was up since 3 because the little one was puking all night. So what are you doing now with the 4.30 club? Uh-huh. So we know all the knowledge. How do we implement it in our daily day to make our life more manageable? Yeah. Well, that's why we have to watch some of our podcasts. You know, we trying to teach people tools. And even if you'd like implement it like 80% of the time, your life's going to be way better. 
Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Very true. I tell I tell people that they can do three things every day to to completely alter their life. Okay. One, make your bed every morning. Mm -hmm. Two, go for a ten minute walk outside. Mm -hmm. And three, write down a couple things you're grateful for. Yeah. That's the easiest place to start, and everyone can do that. No matter if you have twelve kids, two kids. uh, I mean, I don't know. Actually, I don't know that situation. That seems very. That's a lot. But I think. The majority of us can start with those three things every day and see where it takes you, see where it leads you. And when you do the things that are grateful for, you have to write them down because it's a forcing function and you can see it and you believe it and it's it's much more helpful if you write it down. And it gives you a first sense of accomplishments. Like if you talk about like Wes Watson or all the great teachers, all those guys, you're stacking wins, right? All the motivational speakers, mm-hmm. do my bed perfect in the morning. It's the one thing I control and I did a good job. Right. And I'm proud of myself. Everything else is reaction. My boss is yelling at me. Kids are screaming, you know. I did one thing perfectly. Then I I love the walking because it's a kinetic feedback. Of course, it's a grounding exercise, you know. Because sometimes we are so in our heads that we forget just to breathe. Breathing just... Meditation is just nothing but breathing and slowing down your mind because you really feel like, oh, I can just be with myself for one second. It's so difficult to do because our mind is always racing to the Mm -hmm. past or to the future. And gratitude, yeah, I'm big on this. Like, there's so many things. Dude, we have eyesight. You can see right now. You many, you know how many blind people would love for you to be able to see right now. I mean, people take those things for granted. Of course. Oh, I have a, I have a bad car. It's a used car. Do you know how many people love to have a car? You know, just like. So maybe it was good for me that in my addiction, everything was ripped away from me. It stripped me bare, and now I'm really thankful for small things. Like today, I had my little coffee. I'm like, oh man, the hotel room has a little coffee machine. You know, a little, you know, like a little Nespresso or whatever. I'm yeah. like, oh, I'm drinking coffee like George Clooney. <laughs> you know, it's small things, but in the moment, I was happy for a cup of coffee. Yeah. Because then think, I have to make my millions back. I have to be, become a billionaire. I have to get my private jet, you know. You're always unhappy. But now in this moment, I'm like, man, free coffee. Oh, huh, look, oh, I'm a little bit like George Clooney right now in this moment, right? Which is funny, but that's just like, it's it's mindfulness. I'm I'm happy to be alive. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Um, okay, let's go back. So we were at number four for your ten steps to mental mastery. Mm-hmm. Let's just uh, quickly run through the rest of them so people know what they are. Well, if you got them, it goes back to mastering the day in a sense uh-huh. where the book the book ends. Uh, mastering the process it's different. The process is more for like sports specific stuff. Yeah. you know, of course, mastering the state of mind. It's so funny because the world we're living in is not the world we're seeing. Our perception is not real. Mm. It's filtered through a state of mind. When I'm roid raging, I'm angry, I'm drunk, nothing you will tell me will make any sense to me. I'm like, oh, screw you and your stupid mental health stuff, right? But when I'm sober, I'm dialed in, right? And I'm like, wow, gratitude journal is a really good thing, right? So the main key takeaway would be probably the response yep. and mastering my state of mind. Mm. Even being consciously aware that you're in a bad state. Just, you know what, Jackson, I don't want to talk to you today. Let's talk again tomorrow. Yeah. When I'm more receptive because I need to be aware of my own state. Mm. When I'm just unconsciously raging, angry at the world, I'm not very receptive to anything. The best podcast in the world will not change my, right. my life. I have to be in a receptive state. So I'm working with people like, okay, we're in a really bad state right now. Deep breath. What can we do to get you out of the state of this right now? And then you'll be more teachable tomorrow. Mm. Because if I'm really angry or like punching holes in the wall, <laughs> nothing you will tell me will help me, right? So I work with people to get you out of that state. So like breathing techniques, you know, like sensory thing, grounding. We were talking about walking. Something other than being in your mind and being so angry that I'm no longer receptive to you really good podcast because I'm just... So we have to change those things, you yeah. know. So that's one of the things to you know mastering the state of mind. Yeah, and that goes down to your physical as well. Physical. That's the first thing. Take an ice cold shower. Call me back in five minutes. Oh, screw you! And then five minutes later, oh, hey, Pat. Yeah, man. Sorry, man. I was really in a bad state of mind. That's all it is. It's all interconnected. It's know? all. It's all. Our physical world, our our spiritual world. It's all the same. The next thing is, how do I get you out of the state? Be of service to somebody else. Mm. Help one nice old lady over the, over, over the street because one day you're going to be an old dude and you're going to need some help, you know. Right. Um, donate five bucks to some organization that helps people. It gets you out of that bondage of self. Me, me, I'm angry. I don't listen to Jackson. Who's Patrick? Ah. 
just do something, a small act of kindness, of service, gets you out of that state. Because you start thinking, what can I do for Jackson? What can I do for you right now to get me out of my own egotistical state of mind? Yeah. Because we all live in ego. 99% of the time is all about Patrick, Patrick, Patrick. What can I get out of this podcast? How many views are we getting? How many books are we selling? What's going on, right? <laughs> but instead of like shutting up for one second, it's like, hey, how can I be of service for your foundation? Can Patrick do something for your cause to raise awareness? It gets me totally out of my state of ego into a state of service. Right. Service is the key. That's like the reason that. like AA meetings, like even if you make the coffee, well, my ex-wife never talked to me. And then you go to a meeting and I'm like, yeah, my ex-wife just overdosed and she's dead. Holy moly. Hey, Paul, how can I be of service? How can I help? Can I get you right? right? Is there anything I can do for you today? It gets us out of our egotistical bondage of self. We're all slaves to our ego. It's yeah. a terrible master. Mm -hmm. You need the ego to get you the drive to finish the rep, but you don't have ego run your life because then you're always going to be reactive. Right. Because you said, I'm fat, but I'm too skinny, but I'm too big, I'm too, my accent is just too strong, I'm too Germanic, too American. I'm always constantly fighting with the world. But when I let go and let God, it's an old AA saying. It's a good saying. I'm just literally happy right now. We're in a nice room. It's a nice hotel. It's beautiful. I, I love the cause that you, you, you're promoting. I love the podcast. And hopefully we reached one person that may change their state of mind. Right. Maybe it's like, you know what? Maybe I can call somebody today. Maybe, you know what? I'm going to help my grandma clean the yard. It's stupid stuff, but it gets me out of myself. Right. That's always, that's always been the goal. One person. Mm -hmm. One person sees a tweet, hears a sees an Instagram post, hears the podcast, one person. Mm -hmm. One person is, is always enough, always, because that one person's life means everything. Everything, yeah, right? It means everything. And so, and there's always a domino effect of that because um, then we give more permission for people to feel what they're feeling and get the help they need um, and things of that nature. But anyways, all right, keep going. Well, also one person says, you know what, you don't have to say, well, I was suicidal two years ago. That's maybe too much information. You say, I was in a bad state of mind last year too. And really, you know, I lost my dad. I was really sad last year, but I talked to somebody. This one person is spreading the word. And that's how you create a movement. Right. So I know for addiction, we always say we're only like 30, 40 people in my rehab, right? And we're all getting better. No, addiction affects 10 people on average in America. Mm. So this room affects 400 people, not 40. And then they're going to be nice to people and they maybe stop drinking. That's 4,000, right? And right. we're spreading the word. That's and huge. So that's the movement. So if you say, hey, I overcome really bad suicidal tendencies, I'm mentally better than last year, and you talk to 10 people, you are literally creating a movement. Mm -hmm. And that's the power of like the podcasting and the YouTube. If one kid gets something out of our stuff today, our, our time was well spent. Absolutely. If one person sitting in a dark room right now, either with a bottle or a gun or both, which is a scary combination, just know that it's always darkest before dawn, but the light will become. And we made it through, I made it through, and you can make it through, but you have to talk to another human being like you and I talking. Hey, what's going on, brother? You doing good today? Oh, I'm having a rough day. What's up, man? And really be present. Mm -hmm. Don't be talking to Jackson on the phone. Oh, man. Oh, your sister. That's too bad, bro. Yeah, okay, bro. Let's watch a movie later. No, be present in somebody else's life, you know? Right. Yeah. And we, we don't actually know the downstream or the ripple effects of our one act of kindness. I'm getting text messages from something I said in a meeting nine months ago, ten, years, ten months ago in like a meeting in Jacksonville. Yeah. Hey, Pat, that really changed my life. I don't even remember saying that, but all those teachings that we take for granted, like event plus response equals outcome, most people don't know those things. Like, I, we know so many nutritionists, you know, they know their macros, the macros are always tight, the mm -hmm. macronutrients. Most people don't even know what a carbohydrate is. So sometimes even going back to basics and raising awareness, it's awesome. And that's the reason I love those podcasts. We can talk to millions of people or hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands. We're going to find the one person who needs our message today. Right. It's unlimited reach and the person that needs it the most, it's going to find them. At and least, even, I believe that. And also use this podcast as a tool. I'm talking to you guys out there. What if Jackson's message is really like doesn't resonate with you, but you know your sister, your brother, or maybe a friend that you're not feeling comfortable talking to? It's like, hey, I'm watching this really cool podcast. Just sharing the podcast will help raise awareness. Right. The consciousness, you know. I may be afraid to talk to you. Hey, you know, we're maybe too close even. Like we're like family. I'm like, hey, 
are you okay today? But hey, I'm listening, I'm listening to this really cool podcast. You want to look at, you know, you want to check out with me. And then that's when we can be more aware. And that's maybe a way to convey the message, to send the message without being too pushy. Yeah. Because sometimes in our society, we also like, uh, we have uh, this fear of being too intimate, like too intimate. Like I'm, I'm like, hey, Jackson, are you really okay today? Because the average American answer is always like, I'm good. I'm mm -hmm. fine. How yep. are you? Fine. Okay. Okay. Have a nice day. And you can see they're smiling, but I can see the sadness in their eyes. But then what's the next step for me to approach you? Because you just said you're fine, but I know that you're not fine. Yeah. That's a challenging one because you don't want to, you know, push someone to share something they're not ready to share. Um, you don't want to be overbearing, but you just kind of show that you care by not maybe not asking another question, but just being like, you know, if you aren't fine, mm -hmm. I, I am here. Okay. That'd be cool. Like just in case you you know something changes or like you know you can always call me. Right. Just this reassurance in the super fast hyperactive world that another human actually gives a damn about you, mm -hmm. that could save a life right there. Yeah, right means there. A lot. Absolutely. That's the thing. People coming to rehab, you know, like man, the people are really nice in community because we all have the same. We want to live. Rehab is a wonderful community because we don't care about social status. We don't care about skin color. We are all in there to heal, to live. So that's the cool thing about our community too. I don't care if you're rich or poor. Mental health affects all of us. Like addiction is an equal opportunity killer. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, black or white. We need to talk about mental health. Right. And I'm glad that the NFL started opening up a little bit. Ten years ago, it was a taboo subject. Do you remember Brandon Marshall coming out saying he's bipolar with mm -hmm. the New York Jets? I work with the Brandon Marshall Foundation. That's where I got certified as mental health first aid certified guy. That was revolutionary 10 years ago. Like saying, I have a mental uh, health issue and I need some help. Right. Because, dude, I was like a soldier. Bro, I'm fine. I'm fine. Everything is fine. And I was having like suicidal thoughts, but I would never admit it to the NFL. Mm. And he was really like a hero for coming out saying, listen, something is up. I need some help. Absolutely. And now the NFL is like a battleship, right? It takes a long time to turn, but now they're investing millions in helping the mental health of the players, you know? Which is amazing. We see that in, in a lot of sports moving in that direction at least which is what we need you know moving the needle slowly every day towards uh optimizing our, our mental wellness and it also means that coaches have to evolve right and the old way my high my, it's my way or the highway the old high school coach who runs like a dictator hey you run till you puke you run some more son because mm -hmm. it's my way you have to be more involved with parents you have to explain to parents what are you doing with my son right because I don't want to be have a high school star who's like later beating up his girlfriend two years later, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be a big challenge for the coaches. That's right. the reason we go into mental performance and optimization. Right. And recovery too, you know. Just changing the culture around it, slowly but surely. But that was a really deep question you asked me. I'm still thinking about it because my son is 12 right now. He started playing football. Mm -hmm. I don't like the concussions because they changed my life. They changed my mental health, you know. But if he enjoys the game, but do I want to yell at him to make him tougher? You know, but I catch myself too. The coach are like really good dudes. They're like dudes, you know. They're not like my coaches in the old days, yeah. you know. Hey, yeah, very cool. Yeah, hey, you guys have enough water. Everything's cool. I'm like, and I'm catching myself like, oh my God, what's going on here? Is it like a day spa? <laughs> because I'm used to like, like, hey, why did Germany lose the Second World War? Because of beep, beep, beep like you, right? Mm. I'm used to when you're injured, I'm dyeing your jersey pink because you're in beep, beep, beep. Beep, beep, beep. You know what mm. I'm saying? It's very sexist. It's very homophobic. It's just a hardcore environment. Like for me, my definition of an injury, let's just be real for a second. If somebody, if an ambulance takes you to the hospital, that's an injury. Everything else is a day at the office. Mm. But that's a brutality against myself that's almost lead me to drinking myself to death, right? I don't want that for my son. But I'm still struggling. How do I teach my knowledge to my son without being as hardcore as the coach who, who, who taught me? Right. That, that's that's, that's the dynamic, right? How, how do we optimize the performance without pushing you to the breaking point? Yeah, it's extremely challenging. Yeah. Extremely. I think about it daily. Because the more I put you down, the more you define yourself and the more your ego develops when you're like a superstar. But then I can rein in the ego again. How do I manage that, right? It's, uh, it's, it's, it's tough, but we're working on it. Yeah. But then I look at people like Peyton Manning, who is very competitive, mm -hmm. but he's truly a genuine good person. Right. That's something maybe we can mold ourselves. I play with him with the Colts, you know? Yeah. And it's like Peyton Manning. Like, hey, Patrick Wensky, right? The first German player in the NFL. I'm like, 
Peyton Manning knows my name. You're like a backup free agent offensive lineman, yeah. you know, like just like, and Peyton Manning remembering my name, you know. And he's still consistently a wonderful person with a sense of self-depreciation, sense of humor. But don't don't get me wrong, he was a ruthless competitor. Right. So how do we manage that being hardcore on the field, but being a nice human being off the field? It is because guys That's a like challenge. that. It makes it it, it it is possible. It is possible. Right. Eli Manning, they're like they're funny dudes, you know, but they are very competitive. You look don't at get me guys wrong. Guys like LeBron James, right? Yeah, yeah. Tom Brady, like the the ultra competitive athletes on the field. They have a dog mentality. They're gonna outplay you and outwork you, but they have. You know, in their families, I assume I don't live with them or spend mm -hmm. days with them. They have their family life. They spend time with their kids. They seem well-rounded. Sometimes they like to go out, maybe have one drink, mm -hmm. right, and have a normal life. But they have that side of them that's created them to be the best athletes in the world. So it, it is possible. In my head, it is possible to optimize your wellness and optimize your performance and for them to go hand in hand. But there's more cases of it not being the case. So that's where we see more prevalent than the guys who are making it work. And for young, for coaches like me or for any coaches that are watching, they're teaching young players, that's what we have to work on. That's our challenge. That's, that's what we have to convey to our young athletes. Maybe like a balancing act where the whole team uh, goes to a homeless shelter or goes to a soup kitchen and does something of service to balance that relentlessness. You have to be the best. You have to be number one, you know, winner takes all with some kind of service work to keep them ego in. I'm like, wow, that's how people live, you know? Yeah. Like we have the homeless tunnels in Las Vegas and we go to the tunnels and really help people with like a bottle of water, mm. very basic stuff, but it gets me out of my own bondage. So maybe, yeah, you're the best, you're, the number, you're a killer, you're number one, you're the best baseball player in the state of Florida, right? But also on the weekends, give back to your church. Mm. Be a greeter at church, say, hey, welcome to our church, you know? Small things to maybe balance that out. That would be a good approach, maybe. Yeah. Just the service work. Don't think that only because you have great athletic gifts that you're entitled to anything. Because that's the thing in American society, too. Yeah, he's a real a-hole, but he's really good at baseball, so we let it slide coach, right? right? I know, I see it all the time with football players, and I was coaching, too. And there's some kids who didn't go to class, but I had a game coming up, and the rule was, if you don't attend class, you can't practice, you can't play. I'm like, yeah, you know, Jimmy, he was at the doctors. You know, we take care of little Jimmy, because Jimmy could play. I was catching myself doing the same things that I really looked down upon. Mm -hmm. It's just interesting how that works, right? Because you, I want to win. Right. So how do we change a culture where coaches say, hey, we have to live and die for a team and they're making 10 million a year. They fly private jets. They have their own agents. Hey, go, go uh, Alabama forever. And then they go into the Dolphins the next week and those things, you know. I don't know. I think service is the key to everything because for one moment, I think about something other than myself. Mm. I'm big into service. Just cleaning up a chair, like small things in the cafeteria, just helping a nice old lady with their walker. Just, hey, can I get you, can I refill your drink today? Is there anything Patrick can do today to be of service? That helps me tremendously to be in the present moment. Yeah. Amazing. Because then I think, well, at least I don't need a walker right now. Instead of complaining, oh, my knees are so bad, you know, I played football, my shoulder is bad, I'm in pain all the time. At least I'm not 80 needing a walker. So I can help this nice lady and maybe I can carry a drink for her while she's having a little walker, right? Yeah. For this one moment, Patrick stops complaining about his knees and starts thinking about another human being. And I truly believe that love, compassion, and service is the key to master the moment. I couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. Um, wow, yeah, this has been great. Yeah, thank you. We had an instant connection when I called you. I was like, high energy, I want my third Red Bull. What's up, bro? What's up, man? We're gonna change the world. Recovery, addiction, mental health. You know, he's like, whoa, Pat, good to see you. You know, I'm like, yeah. But we had that instant connection because we truly deeply care for humans. Yeah. And like you said, you had that riddle, the final riddle. How do we optimize performance and protect mental health? Mm -hmm. Because what Michael Phelps did was not healthy. It wasn't a healthy lifestyle. Right. But I mean, he's now immortal because he's the best in the world. Yeah. So I want my son and my children to be the best in the world, but I don't want them to have DUIs because he got two or three DUIs already. Right. He got a little alcohol situation too, you know? Yeah. So, and yeah, that was... He's advocating for these things and he's trying to change the culture as yeah. well. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that's the, that's the life's work, you know? That's what we're, we're pushing for every day with more of these types of conversations and more companies and, and apps moving forward to change this and, and coaches learning more about this stuff and hiring on mental performance coaches and sports psychologists and, mm -hmm. and having different variety of, of information being presented to our athletes and all this, all this good stuff. But yeah, any, uh, any last minute things you want to say? 
Questions, uh, comments, concerns, funny stories, anecdotes? Thank you so much for having me on here. Anytime. And I love it. I will update you on some of the programs we're doing with Nithnik Behavioral Health, you know, with the mental health, yeah. and uh, about the STAR app. So anything I can do to help people. My first question is always, how can I be of service? Because I feel I have to make some amends for my egotistical ways in the old days, yeah. you know. Uh, if you're listening to us, thank you so much for listening, uh, for joining us. Um, just know it's okay not to be okay and get some help. Talk to somebody. Don't stay in your state of loneliness, despair, and then you just go down that drain, right? That's all I have, really. If nobody told you that you're loved, know that I love you, that Jackson actually cares. There's two people here who devote their lives to actually giving a damn, and you're not alone. And that's all I have, brother. And uh, where can people find you if they want to reach out, talk to you, hear more about your story, maybe hire you to speak at their school? Yes, I'm so good like pushing recovery. I'm not very good at pushing myself, you know. But I'm on Instagram, uh, Instagram PV Game Changer. I'm the Game Changer on Instagram. And uh, you probably can get a hold of me. Um, and you're on LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn, yeah. Patrick Venske, V-E-N-Z-K-E. And you can Google me. You find a bunch of like online stuff on mm -hmm. recovery and some really honest like brutally honest like authentic uh, articles i have nothing else left to hide there's no ego to protect yeah i just want to save one life one day at a time and i'm saving my own life by servicing others right by giving that's it i'm saving my own life it's a very selfish act actually you know so yeah check out um is there an email people can reach you at yeah <laughs> I should know those things, right? Well, you can just tell me and I'll put it in the show. Yeah, put, put it later in the show. It's a gamechanger at gmail.com. Okay. Yeah, I'm just getting my website up and stuff, you Sweet. know. Because I give hundreds of speeches, but I really don't promote my, my speech. But now it's changing. So, yeah. yeah, I will have all this stuff on your website to make sure people can get a hold of me. Great, perfect. I love that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate Thank you guys it, for watching. Thank you, guys. Uh, this is actually the last episode of 2021. So, we'll take... Uh, all of December off from episodes and then we'll come back in the first week of January for episode number 77. This is episode number 76. Thank you for watching. Have a fantastic Thanksgiving, a beautiful New Year, a beautiful Christmas, whatever holidays you celebrate and uh, we'll see you in the New Year with some more episodes. Thank you. Thank you.